Stanford University. Aha, we're live. Um, welcome to the first class of the spring quarter EE380 2008-2009. Uh, since this is the first class, we'll go through the administrivia. This class is a one unit pass, no credit class. All assignments are turned in via the webpage, EE380.stanford.edu. The requirements are to view, preferably in person, 10 lectures and submit a review which convinces us that you saw and understood the talk. Um, one reason to, uh, the, the, the talks are usually webcast, but occasionally there are things that happen and they can't be, so please try and attend. Uh, it's actually a better experience. Subject of this class, as you, I hope you know, is computer systems broadly construed. We broadly construe computer systems in this class because the way computer systems change the world is broad. Today's speaker, Trevor Blackwell, is probably best known for his involvement in Y Combinator. I had to say it, and that's unfortunate because he's done some amazing things in robotics, which is the subject of today's talk. And I don't want to step on that, but I want to mention something else that he's done that's really, really, really cool. Many of us have seen and played with segues and thought, okay, well, for three grand, maybe, yeah, whatever. Trevor gave us on the web plans to build one for less than 500 bucks, less than 300 bucks, somewhere in there, depending on what you can find uh, if you have a spare motorized wheelchair lying around. Um, but segues, we could all have one. Cool. All right. So does this microphone work? Doesn't sound uh, like it works. It, yes, right. he's saying yes. Okay, good, good. Um, so I, I've, uh, Paul Graham was going to talk uh, today, my, my partner in Y Combinator, uh, but he, he couldn't. Uh, so uh, I just, I was, I signed up for this uh, in the middle of last week and I'm thinking, oh, April 1st, maybe I, sh maybe I should do something funny. Um, but what I realized was that I think the internet has basically destroyed April Fool's Day. You know, it basically like the, the, the funniness of pranks r relies on, um, them not having been seen before and, and basically on a lack of information. Um, and so in this sort of post-internet world where everything's indexed and, uh, and archived on the web, uh, you know, and you can read about like 800 pranks today on, on the front page of Reddit, um, you know, that, that, that whole thing is, is kind, of, kind of dead, I think. Um, I'm sure people will keep, keep doing stuff. But <laughs> if there's a good one left, I, I, I very doubt it. Um, uh, and in fact, like even like the sort of opening joke at uh, at talks has kind of been killed by the internet because it used to be like so I'm in my late 30s and I was giving in grad school in like the mid 90s uh, and uh, so at the time if I wanted a you know sort of opening joke for a for a talk I would just go to someone else's talk you know where I didn't think there'd be a lot of overlap with the audience you know some humanities talk. Um, and uh, you know, just pass that joke, joke off as my own, and, and it, would, it would work great, and everyone th would think I was cool and funny. No one would, would bust me on it. Um, but but you know, now that everything is is sort of archived and, and searchable, um, like you can't get away with that anymore. Um, you, you know that the old joke where there's uh, like a bunch of prisoners sitting around, and one of them yells out like number twenty three, and everyone laughs, and one of them yells out number twenty six, and like everyone everyone groans. And, because they've numbered all their jokes, but uh, it's like I think that is basically happening to us, right? It's except uh, except uh, you know instead of numbers we have URLs. So if I if I want to say something funny, I just like do that and get a get a huge laugh. Um, <laughs> 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 this could stop laughing. Oh, yeah. um, but here's what I actually want to talk about. Um, I want to talk about, so, so I've been working on trying to get robots, like biped robots, to walk for most of the last eight years. Uh, it's, it's not the only thing I've been working on. Um, uh, so I've, I've figured out a few things about why it's hard and what more is probably needed to make auto forward progress on that, on that problem. Um, so I, I first want to talk about, you know, why, like, 
how, what is it that humans are doing? How complicated a thing is it? Um, and so, you know, we, we, we probably can't hope to do it in a robot with, with, either, with much less complexity than, than humans do it. Um, and, you know, if, if, we're, if we're lucky, it won't be too much more. Um, so, so I'll, I'll, you know, try and talk about what, what's actually difficult um, and about, I mean, a, a lot of sort of any physical skill is being able to predict what's going to happen, you know, half a second or, or so ahead. Um, and so, you know, the, the, accuracy, the accuracy of that prediction is a big part of what you learn with thousands of hours of practice. Um, so I'll try and quantify that. When I say quantify, like, you know, it's, it's quantifying the number of digits, basically. Um, not, not anything like a real number. Um, and, and, you know, so, so maybe some estimate of the amount of experience needed. Um, and then how that applies to humanoid robots and what my big plan is for collecting the amount of data we need. Um, so balance for an inverted pendulum is, is pretty easy. Um, you know, this is like chapter one of most control theory textbooks. Uh, so, you know, an inverted pendulum looks like this physical, it's this physical system that looks like, you know, two integrators with a positive feedback loop around it. Because like the first integrator is acceleration to velocity and the second is velocity to position. And so, um, so if you want to control that, you, um, you have to build a, you know, another control system with more negative feedback than there was positive feedback. Um, and, and so, you know, this is, this is basically pretty easy. Um, if, you know, if, if you, like without the, without the, uh, without any feedback, you know, if you give it a small disturbance, you get basically this red line where it sort of falls over with ac accelerating speed. Um, and, you know, if you build your control system reasonably, it'll sort of just make a little wiggle and, and return to, return to the, the set point. Um, and, you know, in, in some real implementation of this, uh, you know, there's some, there's some small delays if you're doing a sort of typical kind of DSP thing. It's probably on the order of a millisecond on both on the sensor side and on the motor side. Um, but, you know, that, 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 that's hardly noticeable. Um, so here is, here is such a system. Um, it's got wheels rather than a torque generator on the bottom. And it has about a one millisecond feedback loop. Um, so it's, you know, you can make these kind of things very, very robust. Um, <laughs> right, you, you, you couldn't have. Um, and neither could um, something with four wheels in about the same envelope. Um, because, you know, it, 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 like you only have to tip it, whatever the, the, the tan, tangent of the height over the width of the base. Um, in order for it to fall the rest of the way. Um, whereas this thing can, you know, effectively move its base back, you know, several feet in order to, in order to uh, survive it. Linear feedback yeah, that is basically just linear feedback. It's like a PID loop where I, you know, compare the, like the Y coordinate of the center of gravity to the... You have to kick it hard enough so it comes over. Right, well, there's, there's definitely some, like, if, if you think about what it has to do... Acceleration <coughs> limited wheels. Right, it's, it's exactly the acceleration limit of the wheel. So if I'm, if I'm applying the impulse to the top of it, what it's got to do is be able to move the, the bottom at least that fast. Um, and so, like, it's important to have a lightweight bottom, for example. Um, so in, in this kind of thing, it actually helps a lot to have the center of gravity high. It's, everyone finds that counterintuitive. Everyone thinks, you know, you should put the batteries in the base to make it more stable, but it's the opposite. Um, so, so much for easy problems. Um, when, when humans are just standing, balancing, th they're sort of solving the same problem as that kind of simple inverted pendulum. Um, but there's a huge difference in that the delay, both, both the sort of sensor delay, um, the, 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 you know, the nerves going from the inner ear into the brain, and the motor delay, the nerves like going down the spinal cord into the muscles, are, are like 100 milliseconds of, of delay. Uh, nerves, are, nerves are slow. Like if, if you went and designed a control system and you said, oh, we're, yeah, we're going to have 100 milliseconds delay in the, in the wiring, everyone would think you're 
Most we're crazy. Mostly it's controlled by the muscles, not by the brain. Well, not in the case of balance, where it really does have to come from the inner ear. No, that's the slow, low power, low. The three parts, it's the muscles take most in the energy. Then the visual system, finally the vestibule system. But these are all much lower power. Study your anatomy. The this doesn't work without sensory input. Yeah. My leg muscles don't have sensory input. Yes, they do. Uh, I don't think this works. They, they, they do, in fact, have some in, in the muscle spindle, so you can... You, you can, there, like there's a nerve... That's not a good enough. Right, it's not. It's, it's not what you, what you need. I mean, you need the... You, you typically need, like, inner ear and, uh, and visual in order to, to... And, you know, you can test that, actually. If you try standing on one foot, um, you, you know, normal people can do that pretty easily with their eyes open, but with their eyes closed, most people cannot, cannot do it um, actually, that's for, for very long. There's something wrong. Right. <laughs> they can still do that. They do it with a higher variance. So, so there's some evidence, at least, that, that you know, the, the signal at least has to travel from the head all the way down the, the spinal cord to your, to the, to your calves. Um, I've, I've done some experiments on, on trying to test this. Uh, it's, it's surprisingly hard to do the experiment. Um, I mean, the obvious thing you would try to do is put yourself on a force plate and have someone give you a push. Um, and we'd try this, and we'd always see, like, you, you know, we would actually see the response on the force plate before the push happened, because, like, you, you feel the air current, or you... One side couple. Say again. If you if you put somebody on a, on a scale, I, I work on this stuff. Sorry. Mm -hmm. if you put put yourself humans on scale, and they do that in the hospital to, to check up certain things. You, uh, they actually measures basically four four first. But anyway, the front half and left right both are stabilized, and one signal goes into the other channel. It's one sided couple. And most of that energy comes from the muscles. Right. It's a little more complicated. We fit. It's definitely complicated. Um, Sorry? We fit measures this. We, the uh, Nintendo Wii game, has a sensor, has a oh. platform to, to do this experiment. Right. Yeah. So Instead, I use it for medical tests if you have something right. a problem with your visual system or your vestibule system. Right, so we built kind of the deluxe version of that, which actually fits into a pair of shoes, um, has, has uh, like a three pressure sensors um, and, uh, and, and mag trackers on it, so we know position. Do you have in your shoes? Uh, three. Um, so we're just, getting, we're just getting torque, really. We're not getting lateral force. Um, but for that simple experiment of just giving someone a push, uh, uh, that, that's, that's, that's the main reaction is just at the ankle. Um, so... So, I mean, the, 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 the point here is that with a lot of feedback delay, uh, the problem becomes much, much harder. Um, because you have, to get, you have to get the response basically exactly right. Um, you know, if you, if you have a very tight control loop, you can just set the gain, you know, 10x higher than, than the minimum you need. Um, and that's, you know, that, that works fine. It, it's, it, you know, as long as it's adequately damped and, and, and everything. Um, but when you're, f when you're, when the delay in the feedback system is on the same order as the time constant of the overall system, um, y you know, it, it, it becomes much more complicated. Um, so if, if you think about what happens when, when this human is given a, a disturbance, uh, you know, so this, this is about 200 milliseconds here. So it, it, does two, it goes 200 milliseconds before, like, there's even an opportunity for the control system to do anything. Um, and then... You know, it, it has to it has to respond in a way that gets it mostly back, in a, in an open loop kind of way. You know, without any without any further feedback. Um, so, like in some ways, that seems like a terrible design. Um, you know, it's it's certainly not the way you would design any kind of industrial robot. You know, the first thing you do there is you make sure that your feedback loop is you know a, at least ten x faster than the highest uh, natural frequency anywhere else in the system. Um, uh, and yeah, so let me, sh let me show a video of me trying to control a robot Oops. With, um, with not only my visual processing delay, but probably another 50 milliseconds built in to the, you know, just in the, in the computing. Uh, so there is uh, an early version of our walking machine. Um, 
you know, I'm, so I'm sitting there like making it do all that. Um, and with like a few hours of practice, you know, like, which I guess is maybe on the order of a thousand times of, of, uh, of having, failing and having it fall over. Um, you know, with hours of practice, I was able to do this, you know, where I'm controlling ankle torque. And like, if I really, if I had to really concentrate to keep it going for any, any length of time, um, you know, it seemed like a, about an equivalently difficult skill to hovering a model helicopter or, do, or, you know, doing one of those things that's, that's hard and needs constant concentration. Um, and then, you know, when I went to try to take the next, go to the next level of like taking a step, it, it, it couldn't even get anywhere close. Uh, so you can see, like, I, I picked up a foot at about 0.6 seconds, and by one second, it's already, like, fallen way too far to have any hope of recovery. Um, so the, the, the time constants, the, t the time you've got to correct for any disturbance is very small. It's like about 0.4 seconds is the relevant, relevant time. That's the, the time constant of an inverted pendulum that's, you know, one and a half meters high of a sort of human scale. Um, uh, so, so, so the, the, si the simple answer seems so far like, well, okay, we'll just build our control system to be, you know, 10 milliseconds and it'll all be a much easier problem than it is for humans. Um, but there are some other reasons why that, that doesn't work. Um, so there's kind of a summary of those numbers. Um, you know, like in a usual sort of industrial robot, you would make, uh, you would make your feedback delay like a tenth of the, the time constant. Um, it seems to be about a half for humans, you know, 200 milliseconds compared to 400 milliseconds time constant. Um, when I'm doing it, plus, plus the robot, uh, you know, there's, there's a little extra, so it's 0.7. Um, for th about the best balancing that you can do, like if you're holding a, like a pencil on top of your finger and trying to balance that, the limit seems to be about one. So you can, you can, you know, if you can get down to about 150 milliseconds inverted pendulum time constant and still, you know, with adequate concentration, um, you can balance it. Uh, in, in, in music, so the, the record for drumming is 1,100 beats per minute, um, sustained for a whole minute, um, or 1,100 and some, um, and uh, which is, uh, you know, it's more than 20 per second. Um, so w what, what that means is that by the time you've gotten any feedback, you know, from through your ear into your brain, back down to your muscles, you're already like three beats later. Um, and it's, it's amazing that people can do that. Um, and, you know, most of that is just because nerves are slow. Nerves uh, conduct its, you know, depending on the nerve technology, vertebrates have much better nerve technology than, than other animals, um, uh, between 10 and 100 meters per second. And, and the faster ones are, are, are bigger and use more energy. Um, and that energy isn't, isn't insignificant. Uh, nerves use something like a third of, of energy in, in higher animals. Um, so they're, they're, you know, there's been like real selective pressure to keep that down. That's really not fair to say, you know, like you were doing with the human and the robot by fingers, there's no subbrain in that loop. You're going through the upper brain. We've got that, that whole subbrain with all that other stuff going on that's, mm -hmm. you know, that's not, that's not conscious balancing, but it's certainly balancing. Well, a lot of the delay doesn't even come from within the brain. Um, like, you know, if, if your nerve conduction delay is, if your nerve conduction speed is 20 meters per second, then that's, yeah. you know, just getting down the, like, almost two meters to your, to your But it legs. goes in and out of the subbrain a lot faster than, you're presumably developing reflexes. The same sort of reflexes that you develop when you learn to walk. Well, that, that was my first question was, you spoke of human balance. Right. There is a variation in the quality of human balance. I mean, the difference between Wozniak and Nureyev um, <laughs> is, is apparent to all. So, you know, we, we don't have a, it's not all nerve speed. There's some other processing element. Oh, definitely. I mean, so, like, the, the, the more detailed analyses I've seen say basically it's about 50 milliseconds, uh, you know, 50 milliseconds of motor nerve, you know, at minimum 50 milliseconds in the brain. It's, it's this time in the brain that varies with practice, obviously, because the, the nerves stay about the same at about 50 <coughs> milliseconds each. Quality. Yeah. Um, the, the quality doesn't vary that much, as far as I can tell. Do you think, um, you think that 
given enough time, Wozniak could learn to dance? No. Well, if he started when he was when he was two, yeah. No, it's not his nerves keeping him down. <laughs> <laughs> Because there, there's definitely, I mean, you have to you have to form some of those kind of feedback loops early in life. I think. Um, That's so great. Not, yeah. Yeah. Right. Chickens can fly without heads, so they don't need a brain at least for a short period. Yeah. So they can do they can do entirely feedback. I I, I want to. I guess maybe I just got to do the experiment. I, I don't think I can deal. <laughs> but but so so. so it depends on where you chop the head off. You used to run on a chicken mm -hmm. farm. Oh, I suspect Palo Alto has some sort of ordinance that would... No, 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 no. Uh-oh. Um, got your plug in that power. Uh, mm. uh -huh. Yeah, wasn't thinking ahead. Where's my bag? You can't blame me because I'm not on AV duty. Um, so anyway, the, 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 I mean, one of, one of the, the things you can quantify is that the amount of delay increases the accuracy of prediction you need because you basically have fewer iterations around that loop to try to fix everything. Um, so here is, here is a video of me jumping onto a unicycle. Um, it's a moderately difficult thing to learn. Um, <laughs> and so the, the video on the left is like, you know, one time and the video on the right is 200 milliseconds earlier. So, like, the things that my muscles are doing were determined by sensory input from, from, from the earlier one. Um, so, so you, you, can, you, can, you can see a bunch of things going on there. Um, so, the, 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 like, I spent, spent weeks practicing this um, <laughs> year, year, years ago. Um, so, what you'll see is, for example, one of the hard things is to get your feet about at about the right point on the pedals, because if you get them too far forward, you're basically on your heels, and if you get them too far back, you're on your toes, and then you can't, you can't uh, drive very well. So you'll see that at the point where I have like the last opportunity to sort of get my feet in the right position, um, the sensory input is from just after my feet left the ground. Um, and so what that meant is I had to do a complete forward prediction over that you know, half meter or more of, of uh, movement and, and get it right within, say, two centimeters. Um, so, you know, that, that gives some sort of rough estimate of, like, how good, how good forward predictions need to be. Um, and so, you know, this is a case where, you know, if you just had a 10 millisecond feedback loop, you, you could do better. Um, but, but that only works in certain... I mean, that, that works in some places, but, but not all places, because often, I mean, there's two reasons why you might have out-of-date information. One is that, um, you know, there, there's a bunch of feedback delay, but the other reason is that you're doing some ballistic maneuver where you are in the air and you don't have an opportunity to change anything for, you know, for up to, up to half a second, say. Um, so... So there's my sort of back-of-the-envelope quantification of how good uh, prediction needs to be to make something human-sized walk fairly, fairly competently. Um, you know, you've got you to predict ahead up to about half a second. You want something somewhere around 2% accuracy. Um, and th the thing that I think takes, takes humans a long time to learn, and presumably robots too, is that you have to do that like, if you're just trying to predict based on identical initial conditions and identical, you know, everything else, uh, it, it you know, should be pretty easy. You should be able to learn that from a few trials. Um, but the hard part is, uh, you know, that initial conditions change a lot, and there's, you know, dozens, hundreds of parameters of initial conditions, you know, meaning, like, your initial position and how fast you're moving. Um, uh, you have to deal with any disturbances that happen. Those usually aren't all that big. Um, and, and 
what I mean by physical states is I. So what what I found learning to ride the unicycles is, is that after after six weeks. I could sort of consistently like walk out of my office, jump on the unicycle, and ride to the end of the parking lot. Um, but when I tried, if for example I went up a hill and dismounted at the top of the hill and then tried to remount, I would I would flub it every time because my muscles are a little bit tired. And it wasn't that there wasn't enough muscle power left; it's that somehow the you know the conversion factor between nerve, like how much nerve impulse I'm sending the muscle and how much torque I get out of them uh, changed a little bit. You know. Right, so my prediction's a little off, and I and I miss it by a little bit, um, and so that's what that's what happens between like you know six weeks of practice and a few years of practice is you learn to do it not only under nominal conditions but you know when you're tired when when you're wearing heavy shoes or light shoes or you know like a hundred other <coughs> things that might might affect you a little bit, um, and so it's you know you you can you can make a reasonable argument that that you know, you, you, that you need that much data. It's not just that the brain is, is being slow. Um, that typically to learn something you need data that's sort of proportional to, like exponentially proportional to the number of variables involved. Um, and, uh, you know, that, that, aren't, that aren't just some sort of simple linear thing. Um, so, you know, it can take when, when you're talking about the hundreds of variables involved in the, the configuration of a human body, uh, you know, it, it, takes, it takes a lot of time, a lot of, a lot of data. Um, so, 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 so the reason why humans need to be so smart isn't just um, that there's this feedback delay. It's that there are things we, like a lot of things we do, um, you have no opportunity for feedback during the middle of the maneuver. So if, if, you, if you jump, you know, you've got control up to the point where your feet leave the ground, and then you've got no control for, you know, three quarters of a, or half a second. Um, no, yeah. you right, you, you sometimes have some control. Um, if you're a gymnast, you get penalized for very much use of your arms, when, you know, during a dismount or something. Um, so, like, to be really good, you have to be able to, to nail it exactly without, without using very much feedback. Not using visible feedback. Yeah, right. <laughs> Judges don't see it. <laughs> right. But, you know, you still have to be close enough, because your, your arms don't actually give you... I mean, your arms can correct several degrees, but not, not, a, not a great deal. Um, so, here was... Um, when you sort of first got our robot walking, this is kind of what it looked like. Um, so, you know, we started off taking one step at a time. And you see every step, like, it was pretty far off, right? It would sort of take a step, and then it would have to correct itself, and then it would take another step and have to correct itself. Um, it's like a There's yeah. like a human learning dog. There's a pre-step motion, it looks like. Before right, so each step, it, right, it kind of shifts, tries to shift its weight a little bit, pick its foot up, put it back down, and then sort of stabilize um, to try to correct all the, all the things that got wrong in the, last, in the last half second. So, you know, that time when, you're, when one foot is up in the air, um, you have basically almost no control laterally. You, you still have some in the, in the front back plane from the ankle that's on the ground. Um, but, uh, but basically you're on this you know, predetermined ballistic trajectory until you put that other foot down. Um, and, and so you have, to, you have to get that right. It's, you know, it's like, sh like you know, there, there's this very complicated vector space and you have to sort of shoot into it at exactly the right point for it to, for it to come out where you need it. Um, push over to the... To the you do, yeah, because like if if you're really standing with your or with your weight equally on both feet, and you pick up one foot, like you fall over really, really fast. Um, you know, it, you basically don't have you barely have time to get that foot down again to to avoid falling over, let alone sort of look graceful. Um, so you definitely shift your weight onto the onto the other foot before picking one up. Um, there, there's another thing going on here, though. That People learn to walk when they're a lot shorter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when, it's yes. e when it's easier. Because the, the, the control signals are shorter. I wish I could get rid of that 
that f confounding problem. Um, it makes smaller robots. <laughs> No, well, like or exponential time is no, always no, it just takes yeah. longer to learn. Or, or clone humans somehow to start when they're six feet tall. tell you, it takes me ten times longer to learn it. I can learn it. And as soon as I stoop down, it's much easier. Well, you think it's easier because you have memory from? Well, from I can see what the others do. I cannot imitate their dynamics very easily. <coughs> but it helps a little bit if I stoop down. Hmm. So they're all kind of tricks. Right. It's, a lot of it is nonlinear dynamics, yes. Yeah, oh, it's all horribly nonlinear. Yeah, um, they say horrible. It's <laughs> challenging. Oh, yeah, yeah no, that, I mean, it's a good... You're telling all the students not to learn anything about nonlinear <laughs> control. It was easy, it already been Should done. encourage yeah. them. Well, I mean, so people spend a lot of time learning this, right? Uh, you know, you, you sort of get the hang of walking, like at some point around when you turn one in, in a few weeks, but... Like to really get good at it takes a couple of years. Uh, you Some know, kids are better than others. Yeah, and, and like, but two and three year olds still fall down all the time because um, they've got it. You know, it, they've they've sort of learned to do it under nominal conditions. But if they're tired or distracted or looking at something else, they they flub it. Well, their penalty for falling is also much different. <laughs> yeah, it's not actually that high for adults. I mean, I learned to ride a unicycle as a as an adult, and I fell I don't know how many hundreds of times. Um, and, you know, yeah, it's one of the first things you learn, actually, is how to, how to fall without getting hurt. Um, so you learn in, in uh, all those fighting arts, it's the, a lot of it has to have to learn how to fall. Yeah. And use the dynamics even to f fight your opponent <coughs> while you fall. So, so the, the problem with watching children learn to walk is that, first of all, like, their brains aren't mature. Their muscles aren't mature. They're this completely different size from the robots I want to build. Um, and and their mothers won't let you do really cool things. Exactly. That. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that informed consent thing gets in the way all the time. Wait a minute, Stanford was here. He took lots of photos of little kids. Back, back in the 60s. Oh, 1860s. Yeah, that was, that was the time to be That's doing human to do subject it. research prior to 1950 or so. It's a lot more fun. Um, um, so, I mean, that's part of the reason why, like, sometime in 2002, I ordered a unicycle from unicycle.com and just kept it in my cubicle and said I was going to, like, try this for 15 minutes a day until I got the hang of it, um, was that, like, I already knew how to walk, so I couldn't, I couldn't watch that learning process again. Um, but so I, I mean I think unicycles are sort of a roughly equivalent difficulty to learning how to walk. It's just you know something you don't you it's haven't already learned. Learn how to walk. Learn to do your uni unicycle. It's still working. I don't think that walking got worse. <laughs> <laughs> Watching robots walk made my walking no, get worse because I'm thinking about it too unicycle. much. You learn, yeah. You you learn. You're scared because you, you're not predicting the right thing. Walk is not a good model to predict unicycle fighting. Yeah, there's, I mean, there's definitely something in common in that, you know, you're sort of moving your feet at, at the same speed as your, your head's moving, but, um, but yeah, so I, I don't know, maybe, maybe I wouldn't do so well on Dancing with the Stars uh, anymore either, because um, I've, I've learned something wrong. Um, so the, the next... Uh, so th there's kind of the next generation of walking where we were able to do it without having to make a big correction after each step. Um, Is the length of the cable why the steps are so tiny? Yeah, um, yeah in fact, probably <laughs> like our room has got not very many extra feet for this whole... Uh, whole so it doesn't look like walking with three inch steps. Like the, the problem is basically the same. I mean, there's the, the hard part in walking is actually the lateral balance, as far as I can tell. The, the front to back is, is fairly easy because you've got so Why much angle control. Why did you give them some narrow shoes? It's much easier to balance with the wider shoes. The most sport shoes are wider. Why would you play? <laughs> um, I mean, we, we sort of consciously went with, uh, with something that's pretty much human foot size. Those are uh, size 13 um, Chuck Taylors that it's wearing. Um, Actually, actually, like we built, in, in the first version of it, we built our own foot. You know, we had a nice, like, rectangular foot that was easy to analyze and 
simulation and CAD models, and we had so we had a you know a foot with a couple layers of foam and rubber to make it soft. And what we found is they kept getting racked because it would you know hit its foot on the floor and it would peel the rubber off. And eventually, we realized that for only about forty dollars, we could buy this really well engineered set of foot bottoms at <laughs> you know local store. Um, how much? How much of this is? Um, do you like train it to walk? How do you like teach it to walk? Is it start from nothing and it's just you definitely cannot do, or is it like you, you definitely like, cannot start like with tabula rasa learning um, because you know if you, if you without any assumptions if you just try to start generating random joint trajectories like a hundred percent of them will just cause it to twitch and fall over and and zero percent will actually take a step um, right so you know I started with something that sort of looked to me like a step um, it didn't do any better than that one I showed uh, at the beginning with, with me controlling it from the Waldo device, so it fell over immediately. Um, and then it sort of iter iteratively improved that. Um, there, there is, in general, this problem that, like, to learn something, you sort of have to get a little bit close so that you're at least in the right region of, of physics before you even are acquiring any data to learn the rest of it. Um, so what, what I'm saying is you didn't, like, give it the brain of Dexter 2.0. And like, just knew how to it already kind of knew how to walk. But did you like start essentially over from like the basics with? Um, I guess actually it was a complete re-implementation of the walking stuff between those two versions. Um, but, but in general, like it, it wasn't that hard to make a step that sort of did something kind of reasonable. Um, the The hard part was the hard part is all getting all the feedback to deal with with different initial conditions. Because, um, you know, if, if you think about it, the, the number of parameters involved in just taking a step, um, you know, you've, we've got 12 joints times maybe about 10 time, time intervals uh, during, you know, which you pick up one foot and put it back down. Um, so something like there's, there's 120 variables in that nominal trajectory, which is, which is way too large to explore, you know, in any kind of, you know, uh, trial and error way. But, but you know, if you start with something that works, uh, it's, it's not too hard to converge on a sort of nominal trajectory that works. And so in simulation, that worked great. You know, we, we started off with some, you know, basic step, and we start from the exact same initial conditions every time, and it, it didn't take very long to evolve a very smooth-looking step. Um, but that got us almost nowhere on the real robot, um, because, you know, there's so many sources of error going on, and so, m like, most of the complexity and most of the parameterization is in correcting, is in feedback. Um, because for each of those, you know, for every sort of one nominal joint angle um, over, over time, um, you know, there's, there, there are several feedback terms, uh, basically about, about 10 to 1, 10 to 1 feedbacks per, um, per, uh, per sort of nominal trajectory. Uh, there's, there's, there's the obvious too, like what to do if you're falling forward and what to do if you're falling right. Um, it, it turns out they're not really symmetrical, um, especially the thing you do when you're falling forward is not at all the opposite of the thing you do when you're falling back. Um, uh, in, in both cases, for example, you need to lift the foot that, that's in the air higher in order for it to not hit the ground before, before you wanted it to, because either way it's, it's kind of getting closer to the ground by virtue of, of falling. Um, and this is something we argued about a great deal, is, is whether we should try to, try to assume there's symmetry between the right and left halves of the robot. Um, there's good evidence that humans do not assume symmetry. Um, you know, there are a bunch of skills where you learn it right-handed and you have almost, like you haven't learned it at all left-handed. Um, not just between different hands, but between um, you know, like, so, so that unicycle jump mount for, that I showed, for example, um, I've, I learned to do it with my right foot forward, but I, I don't have any ability to do it with my left foot forward. Um, it's a, a different enough skill that it just doesn't seem to, like, there, there isn't some mirror imaging function that works pretty well. Um, so so we, we made that assumption that we are just going to have to learn both sides separately. Um, Did the parameters work out? Not very different. <coughs> your legs are the same. Our legs are. Those seem to be the same. I actually 
messed up on the CAD drawing, so one of them is an eighth of an inch longer than the other one. <laughs> Just like a real person. <laughs> well, yeah, that will mean that the parameters you develop in the learning process will adjust that out. Yes. Um, but people are not the same. Right. This robot probably isn't exactly the same, left and right. It's designed to be, but... Well, it's right. an eighth of an inch. Yeah, so, I mean, e even like besides the actual systematic error, there's a bunch of, you know, the weight distribution isn't exactly even. Um, th there's a hazard in doing that in that for a while we learned steps that were, that were asymmetrical, um, where it would kind of do, be doing different things with the right foot and the left foot. Um, and so, like, you, you want it to be doing a, as symmetrical as possible a walk, um, but, but not... But, but the predictive model, you, you don't want to enforce that that has to be symmetrical by having only one version. Enforcing too many symmetries. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I mean, basically when everyone tries to do this, the, the, they assume that the dimensionality of the problem is, is so big that they've got to do everything they can to try to cut, cut it down. Um, and we definitely do some of that. We, you know, the first thing we do is we factor out yaw angle. So we assume that whichever way we're pointing, you know, even though our, our kind of matrix coordinates look kind of different, um, we know that the physics is basically the same, um, uh, no, mat no matter if you're pointing this way or, or that way. Um, so, you know, we factor out the things we think we are pretty confident that are valid to factor out. Have you started things like walking around in a circle? And um, <coughs> we've gotten a little way that way, but, but not not very much. Did it turn out to be harder, or, or just more? I think it's just more. Um, I think it's, uh, you know, so, so learning that one skill of walking with about four inch steps going forward took, took thousands of steps um, to, to, to get that tuned. Um, and, and, you know, significant amount of manual tuning as well as uh, semi-automatic tuning. Um, and, and so I think, you know, like I think there is no way of learning that without, without you know, thousands of steps for every possible thing you want to you wanna learn to do. Um, so, uh, well, here's, here's one more thing we learned was jumping. Um, we, got, we got reasonably good at this. Um, so there are... There we're getting something like 10 inches off the ground to, to measure it at the heels. We, we, we have a few times got, got significantly more than that. Um, so realistic energy absorption. Yeah. yeah it, right. It uses pneumatic actuators. Uh, okay, which have, so they, that's, <laughs> that's the weakness, not, not the intent. <laughs> um, it was sort of intent. Um, I actually wanted actuators that had the same kind of response times as, as muscle. Because um, there are definitely lots of ways of cheating if you have, you know, if you have like a millisecond time constant to change torque. Um, and I sort of wanted to, you know, give myself a realistic problem. Um, but they also have some huge benefits. Um, one of the benefits, I mean, is just that you couldn't really do jumping at all with electric motors uh, because, because the impact when you hit the ground is going gonna, is gonna to break things. Um, uh, you know, the... the, ref the in, in any kind of uh, motor-driven robot legs, uh, the inertia of the motors ends up by far dominating the, the inertia of the whole thing, um, because the you know the inertia of the motors is multiplied by the square of the gear ratio, if effectively, um, and and so for any real robot that ends up dominating. Um, and in fact, the the energy consumption of of motor-driven walking robots uh, goes up as the fourth power of walking speed. For the same reason, um, so when they, you know, when when they are, you know, say they can do two kilometers an hour, like that, that doesn't mean they're anywhere close to doing four. Um, you know, it'd be 16 times as much as much heat produced in the motors. Um, so, so there, there are some traces from our analysis tool showing what the uh, what that jump looks like. Um, you know, I've, I've spent many, many tens of hours puzzling over like, it, what, exactly what, what did it think it was trying to do, what did it do, what should it have done, um, uh, you know, looking at, looking at the, the results of this tool. Um, 
So you know, here's here's time. This is you know half a second or so here. Um, you can see it bends down and jumps up and and lands. Um, the uh, the top two traces are from the knees. Uh, the red line shows the actual position of the knee, like the joint angle. Um, the blue line shows the the target position, and and the space between them, the filled-in space between them, is roughly proportional to the torque. Um, and then that green line shows how far the valves were open, the, the pneumatic valves. Uh, you can see we saturate the valves on the way up. Um, so there, there's a case where we have, where, where, we, where we go through this period where we've got zero lateral controllability because both valves are all the way open. And so there's no way we can push down a little harder with our right foot than with our left foot um, in order to, to correct a, a lateral yeah. imbalance. We could unsaturate the other one. Um, yeah, although in fact, like they're both so so saturated that our feedback loop wouldn't actually do that. Um, but yeah, I mean, you're you're, you're right. Um, in in fact, we think the like the valves we're using have some kind of sigmoidal function. Um, so so when you're beyond ninety percent, actually, it's it's it hardly matters whether it's ninety or a hundred. Variation. There's, there's definitely some, yeah. Um, I mean, that is, that is because we were fighting, um, fighting a, a lateral, you know, trying to maintain lateral stability on the way up. Um, so, you know, during the period where we're like, it, it's pretty close before the period where we're saturated, and then when we saturate, you can see it kind of, you know, we, we yeah, and and <laughs> so you know, we were able to recover from it, but. Um, and I think it's actually pretty common in in human movement to hit hit a hundred percent on several of the muscles during a during a maneuver um, and so I don't know somehow people learn to deal with it they use other muscles they they try to stay a little under a hundred percent so so if we had if we had something that was as clever at learning as a human brain, and we wanted it to control a robot, how much how much data would we need? Well, probably about the same as it takes for humans to learn it. Um, pr probably a little bit more because it's going to be less clever. Um, and so, it seems like a frighteningly large number of steps. I mean, my, so my my guess for you know when a when a toddler you know in that first like several weeks where it can sort of consistently get across the the floor. Um, you know, is is like a hundred hours of practice, five hundred thousand steps, um, and to learn to be really good, like to learn to be, you know, a soccer player, you're talking about fifty million steps uh, of uh, worth of walking ex experiential data. Um, that's probably what you need in order to have some data for each of the possible parameters you'd like to put into your regression model um, to to estimate, you know, to make to make predictions that are accurate to within two percent. You know, no matter how tired your muscles are, and you know what else is happening in in the world around you. Um, that many steps, your bones adapt. If your bones actually adapt. Right, probably. I mean, like they're healing. Remember how long it takes to heal? At the right. same time, concentrate and to adapt to a different geometry. Right. So humans have that additional problem that their bodies change actually, quite quite a bit. That's not too bad. It's another problem. Well, it's it's good in the sense it's it's it makes a learning problem harder, because you know by the end of those fifty million steps, like you've gotten a lot stronger and your bones are thicker and and you know um, robots. I think we can at least factor that one out. Um, although you know the, the number of hours I've wasted trying to understand why you know there was some weird trend in the learning curve, and it turned out it was because some bolt had wiggled loose on the robot over time, and you know the, the data was sort of invalid. Um, I, I wish I could get those hours back. Um, so, bearings are going to wear things like that. It's, it's what? Bearings. Bearings are going to wear things yes. like that. So. Yeah, so I think we need a non trivial maintenance plan um, for. <laughs> so, Mother Nature has for you. These are pretty powerful. So, the thing I want to build now is like the apparatus to co collect 50 million steps worth of walking. Um, and. You know, it's it's not it's not the only thing we need to have good walking robots, but I think it's 
I mean, it's hard to imagine being able to come up with some algorithm that's going to learn how to walk with orders of magnitude less data than that. Um, You looked into those. <coughs> it's, it's this notion of a uh, sort of high dimensional neural network or some other equivalent system that understands what sort of power needs to be put into the muscles to go from one body configuration to another. And you give it, you know, several thousand data points and it's able to interpolate all the, th all the things that are between those data points that you've given it. So, right, I mean, so that, I mean at, at, at a high level, that's, that's kind of a sort of doesn't really work out for walking. Um, those things seem to work great in simulation and not, not at all for real robots. Um, because what, what you're learning isn't just the kind of dynamics, you know, the things that you could simulate if you had, you know, a small enough step size and a good enough, you know, estimate of the the moment of inertia of all your, of all your limbs. Um, it's more like the, the things that the things that take a long time to model are like foot contacts, you know, and what happens if you drag your foot a little bit as you're taking off. Um, you know, it's it's uh, it's it's how to deal with all the ugly, you know, errors and, and non idealities of the of a physical robot that that usually don't show up in simulations. So I mean, there, there, but there are definitely two different approaches, right? There are people who are working on fairly, you know theoretically solid ways of, of making accurate predictions. Um, I tend to fall into the camp of, let's have simple algorithms and just collect enough data t that, that the simple algorithms work. But, you know, there's, there's, no, there's no right answer to which one is better. Well, humans learn much faster than neural nets. That's a fact. Yeah. yeah. There's something to be said for complexity. I mean, in a neural net, the more complex it is, it's exponentially slower to learn. Mm -hmm. Not with humans. Well, although that, like, when you, once you collect the data, you can actually do a su like a, an offline supervised learning process, right? Because the hard part is really trying to make the forward prediction of what's going to happen given a certain initial configuration and certain control inputs. Um, There's still the fact that you know you you're, you're telling it to walk straight forward. You can collect all the data you want on an effort to walk straight forward, and as soon as you try to turn a corner, right, that's useless. Yeah. So not all those 50 million steps <coughs> forward. Um, I mean, I think we may only need. There's probably on the order of you know hundreds of different sort of primitive motions that we might need, and it's probably only hundreds of thousands of steps for each one. Um, so like that 50 million steps that it takes to become a you know a competent adult athlete, um, you know, the, it's. It's not all just one skill, right? It's a lot of different stuff. Um, so I, I assume we need that same kind of distribution for, for robots. Um, so it, you know, we need to, need to put them through some, a lot of paces. Um, so, so I'm trying to create this thing called the Cloud Robotics Lab. Um, so I, I, you know, I, I have my desk and I have that robot you saw, like, 20 feet away from me on the other side of the room. Um, and so, you know, I, I run experiments and, you know, usually I sort of look past my monitor to see what the robot's actually doing. But I realized I hardly ever needed to interact with the physical robot. Um, and, you know, if you go look at, on YouTube, of videos of walking robots, um, you know, th there's a bunch of university labs and they all have, um, you know, like some gigantic harness from the ceiling and like very angry people on the floor next below it. and um, you know, students poking at it with sticks so it doesn't fall on them. And, uh, you know, of all the things that you would like to not have in your office, I think a robot is, like, right up at the top of, of uh, and, and so, you know, we, we, can, we can absolutely do it now. The network is, is definitely fast enough to um, do experiments over the network, um, so you don't have to have it, you know, next to you. Um, you know, we can, we can, I mean, we, we, we've done this just in our, within our own lab of being able to run experiments, you know, entirely from the keyboard, collect data, get the results back, and be analyzing them in, in a few seconds. Um, so I, th I think, you know, in order to get real walking robots that actually work, um, we're going to need a bunch of people working on it. We're going to need enough hardware to collect many millions of steps. Um, and uh, And... 
it'll be enormously more efficient if we put them all in one place with someone who's got a periodic maintenance program to make sure to replace the bearings every some number of hours uh, so that the results are consistent. Um, and uh, you, need, you, know, you don't need that many robots on the order of five, I think, will, be, will satisfy a lot of researchers. Um, so that's... Variation among them as well to make sure... There's plenty of variation without intentionally adding any. <laughs> <laughs> um, I started paying attention to what I'm doing when I'm walking because I, I pull the muscle and, and it's... I think there are two, two modes that I w work in. One is climbing stairs, which look like your picture. You deliberately pick the foot up and, and move it forward. And, and, but that's not the way you walk across a level floor. You just, you just sort of rock a little bit you know, shift your hips and just barely bend your knee enough to get the foot across, and you're and you're you're sliding it rather than picking it up. Right. It, oh yeah, I mean there are definitely much more advanced walking gates than the one we are we're working on. Um, <laughs> that would be somewhere in that 50 million steps. Is <laughs> <laughs> um, but but um, for example, that that mode of walking might work if you put the robot on on ice. Yeah, I mean, there, there's another example of, of something that's in what humans learn, right? Is they learn to walk on slippery surfaces and on sand and so like, you know. So, yeah, that's probably. <laughs> yeah, um, so it's not even maybe the same, I mean, maybe it's more than 50 million steps if we really want the union of what people learn. Like, there's probably few people who are good at walking on ice and walking on sand, for example. Um, so we'll see. So uh, one of the ways we like to do a million different things is we have a lot of more neurons we can kind of program in parallel to be thinking about all these predictions. Like, how big is the brain? How much computation and data do you need to do this? Like, on what scale? Just to walk. Um, yeah, I wish I knew the answer. Um, the, the way I'm architecting it is like our, our approach, and I, I want there to be some other approaches on, on the same hardware, um, is uh, basically we just save all that data. Like we save all 50 million steps. Um, and we can actually do a, an indexed lookup on those pretty quickly. Um, and so the data for like a step is, you know, a couple of kilobytes maybe. Um, so we're talking about, you know, less than a terabyte of, of, uh, of data. Um, and so we can, you know, we can, we can store that. We can look it up in real time. Um, so there, there's some upper bound. It's like 50 million times a kilobyte or something. At some point, you have to accept that I don't remember 50 million different times I've taken a step. <laughs> you know, are, there's, there's some processing and reduction. And have you attempted to tackle it that way? I think, I think people... I realize that's very tuned to the robot, right. which then must not change. Right. It, re it requires having more of a model. Um, and I kind of have this bias against having clever models and, and so just... Then you're locked to the, the hardware. Right. Yeah. As um, I am. But yeah. Similarity to transform. Well, one of the curious things is that humans are much less locked to their hardware than, than other animals. Yeah, you know, humans, <coughs> and well, well, humans can get the hang of walking on stilts, for example, and like seconds, really. Um, and, and actually, most animals are very much worse. They, they can't really learn to control a body that's not, not their own. Um, one of the fascinating, like, for example, monkeys cannot learn to drive. You know, you might think, like... Good! <laughs> <you may, laughs> <laughs> 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 yeah, but that's monkeys on the road. <laughs> 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 Why can they text while they're not doing it? <laughs> <laughs> um, that tells you something about the internal reference model. Right. But that's the difference. I mean, the humans are much better on internal model, not to speak of in a differential right. control point of view. I mean, think right. of you think that I think that you think. If you understand that, the monkey doesn't. Yeah, right. I mean, you definitely, I mean, that, that's one of the problems with, with driving is you have to know about intention. I had a clue until he was a teenager. <laughs> <laughs> tells you something else about even human development. 
But then again, to walk, to walk well, like to get around in human environments, we don't need to be as clever as humans, right? Um, you know, lots of animals walk on two legs pretty well and, and you know, well enough, to, well enough to make a useful robot. So we, we don't have to get all of it there. So how much of the problem gets simpler if you make the feet bigger? Oh, a lot. Um, although, when you make, make the feet bigger, you stop being able to deal with human terrain. I mean, the reason to make something, the reason to make some, like a humanoid robot as opposed to like something with tank tracks or, is, is that, you know, all, all our buildings are designed for humans. And so, like, there are all these steps and chairs and all that kind of stuff uh, that you'd like to be able to reuse. And so, you know, it's, it's only really worth doing making a two-legged thing if it's actually going to be close enough to a human that it'll fit all our environment. Because it's not actually a better design for some sort of, you know, military walker. Um, you know, there you just want to have tank tracks or four legs or something. Have you tried anything like standing up or, or picking something up and its influence on the, on the algorithm? Um, I mean, we've tried just shifting weight distribution. Um, we haven't we haven't tried any of those kind of skills of, of actually picking something up yet. Um, each one, like each skill seems to be taking us, you know, it's the same amount days. of time for one more skill. Yeah, well, I mean, I think we're getting better at it, but it's not, Still. It, it hasn't sort of achieved self-sustaining exponential growth yet. Okay. What are you using for computer in this thing? Um, we, we do the computing off board for our convenience. We have a rack of, of uh, big Pentiums running FreeBSD, a lot of the codes in Python. Um, you know, we, we so, so how many CPUs does it take to drive a robot? We can do it with one, or well, two, two, two like Pentium class CPUs and uh, um, like a, a, a dozen onboard microcontrollers for, for doing low level stuff just for like controlling valves and things like that. Um, you don't do local feedback control? No. Um, I don't think it's, I mean, it, it makes, the only reason it sort of makes sense for animals is that because nerves are slow, but for us we can get up to the real brain in a millisecond anyway, so it, it, it doesn't, doesn't seem, doing anything distributed doesn't seem that useful. Well, because your controller needs a sensor and an actuator, the point is that will put more sensors down where they need it. It's not necessarily compute power per se, but the point is I have more, more sensors. I told you that muscles basically mm -hmm. are both sensors and actuators. They have a local loop. That's the point that's usually missed. Well, I can't figure out what the other sensors are going to do. I mean, we've got, you know, we've got enough to have the six degrees of freedom force on the bottom of the foot, and we know what all the joint angles are and all the torques, right? And so, yeah, I know humans have like a gazillion sensors on every square millimeter of their I skin, but... Why biology came up with more sensors? <laughs> there <laughs> may be a good reason for it. The other thing is the... You know, do we... Is, is the signal that we send to the muscle, is it apply to this torque level, apply to this force level, apply to this uh, position? Opens yeah. Well, well, his, on his, right, for us, it opens about like, for humans. There's there are a, there are a bunch of things going on. I mean, there's a there's sort of just one that controls muscle firing rate, and so the torque depends on how fast it's moving because of the way muscles work internally. Um, does and then, the brain give a torque order or a position order or both. a force order? There's both. Um, there's a there's a, a controllable feedback term also. So you can, you can tell a muscle to sort of hold a position, or you, or you can tell it to just exert a torque, or anything in between. Um, so if it's processing that locally, though, then it, you're not spending the, the 100 milliseconds back and forth. Right. Saying, so you do, get more the tight, you, you do get the tight feedback then. Right. Yeah. So, But, you know, for us, it's more convenient to do that in the main CPU. Um, cause well, I mean, but it would significantly change the algorithm you developed if your input was a torque order as opposed to a valve order. Yeah, in fact, it's, it's some combination of the two. Like we have a, a, we give it a target position and a stiffness. Um, so we can, you know, we have some control over, over that. Just to go back, actually, a couple questions. Never appreciated this until I had to push around a stroller. But most buildings now are actually 
like wheelchair, stroller, et cetera, accessible. As we move forward on the disability thing, doesn't that actually reduce the amount of humanness we need in our so robot access? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah. same way, yeah. you know, yeah. How, are we actually modifying the structures to the other way? So th this guy is the robot, um, the, the white one there is, is the one that we're actually trying to sell a lot of in the next year. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so you know, two wheels uh, can bend at the waist. What does it do other than you can try and knock it over, which is great fun for about <laughs> two hours. <laughs> oh, three, four hours at least. <laughs> <laughs> it's cheaper. And I, but I can get the blow up version, so, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it, ha it has no arms, uh, no, uh, no action, no, like no way of, of really influencing the world. Um, what it is is a telepresence robot. Um, so, you know, if you want to interact with people somewhere else, um, you sit at your laptop and you've got like the video window it's of what it sees. Is. Yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's an avatar for the physical world. Yeah. Um, so everyone keeps talking about how like meetings are going to be all in Second Life or, or something. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, none, none of the hologram technologies are quite there. I mean, the, the, the best ones are um, kind of a spinning um, glass, or like a frosted glass disc. Um, but like, you, you definitely don't want to get in the way of it. Um, Plus, the person you're dealing with doesn't want to stay there. And this can chase them. Yeah. Well, right. That, that's that's where it gets interesting. Is is when there's some combination of interacting with people and interacting with the environment. Um, so you know, we're thinking about people who manage, who are based here, but manage uh, data centers around the world. Um, factory and they, floor. right, manage factory floor. Um, you know, there's all the. I know a bunch of mechanical engineers who work at Apple and like spend one month out of three in some small town in China like measuring the shininess of iPods or whatever it is that they're they're worried about that week um, and so you know being able to do that remotely is 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 valuable so our kind of manifesto is like the hat on the camera yeah they can't they can't but you know they look like the camera right that's an old joke from Africa where some white farmer whatever put this glass eye on a, on, a, on a stump and said, I'm watching you, and then you went away. Guess what? Didn't take very long. To, somebody approached from the back and took that, put the hat over it. Uh, <laughs> local, the local humans were too smart. Anyway, sorry. So, I mean, that's... We're probably over time. Um, <laughs> you got, got another couple of minutes. Five minutes if you want it. Okay, so it's a remote, anno a, a remote way to annoy people. Cool. That's way more valuable. No, it's a physical avatar. That, that's actually that's remote. Right. Advice. So, like, instead of everyone moving into Second Life, right? I think the answer is that most people are actually in the same physical space as the people they want to interact with. Um, it's just a few that aren't. Um, so I've I've been in those kind of meetings where there's like three or four people and we're all sitting around and there's a laptop with a guy on Skype, right? Um, and, you know, inevitably what happens is like we, you know, something interesting is happening in the next room and we all sort of walk out, you know, and like we've forgotten that there's some guy, you know, waving, come back guys. <laughs> um, so we're trying to get that level of physical presence that that's the reason that, you know, all the video conference stuff, you know, I mean, there, there's lots of video conference stuff, and people still fly. So there's there's some uh, unsolved problem there. What do you use for angular orientation? Uh, solid state gyros or something? Yeah, we're using solid state MEMS gyros. Okay. Um, so they're, uh, it, you know, it's like a little vibrating tuning fork, and you get it vibrating this way, and if you rotate it, it's sort of vibrating this way, and so it picks up the Coriolis force uh, electronically. Um, do you actually do dishes, or just not do dishes? Um, well, teleoperated, um, it does dishes pretty well. Um, so there's, you know, there's an operator wearing a suit with, you know, position sensors all down the arm and magic gloves. Um, Are those MEMS better or worse than the semicircular canals? Um, they are, they're probably better than the canals, but they are less good than the canals plus your visual system, seems to be the answer. 
Um, you know, okay. sorry, sorry. drift compensation. Yeah, so drift compensation is is like they they drift a fair bit. You know, it's it's the number the numbers have strange units, but yeah. So you're right. So a lot of it is compensating for drift. Um, and you know, I mean, the human system has failure modes too of getting dizzy and you know. Uh, They're better than something for drift because once you start turning, the fluid starts turning too, and you lose your differential. Right. It only it senses angular acceleration, where the MIMS act actually sense angular velocity. Right. Yeah, and, and I mean, in humans, it's mounted in the head, which seems like a horrible design, um, because I mean, you want to turn your head to be able to look behind you, and that means like the signal is basically inverted, right, or, or coming coming in in the roll channel instead of the pitch I, channel. I don't have the heads locked in. Yeah. Do they? Yeah. They have to. Yeah. They get to. Hmm. Yeah, because the all these farce basically makes a dull compute signal in your brain and so Right. But turning your head doesn't, in practice, turn out to be a serious problem. Well, you know, it's one of the things that took me a while to learn on a unicycle is being able to look back to see if cars were coming. And if you look at kids, the first, you can't do it The first hundred times I did that, I, I lost it. You know, I you did put it up at the old mirror. <laughs> yeah, that, that would have been the right, the clever solution. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Dexter has a very human uh, architecture. Femur, the, uh, right. It's like a ball joint at the hip. Uh, it's actually three nested. But it works out to a, yeah. a full ball joint at the hip. Right. Um, you seem to have gone away from that. Is there something about that architecture that's more difficult, or? Well, walking is hard. Um, you know, we sort of had walking working semi-reliably in the lab. You know, as long as the temperature is not that different from the last time we tried it, and you know, there's. Um, <laughs> Walking takes more energy too. Isn't it? Yes. Well, yeah. So one one of the stunts we want to do fairly soon is is put that white robot in a marathon. Um, we get four hours battery life, and we can go, you know, eight miles an hour. So we think we can actually do a competitive time in a marathon. <laughs> I'm sure, that will annoy people. Not if you put the right costume on it. Beta breakers, nobody knows. Yeah, that's probably the place to do it. People will assume it's a, a midget in a costume. Like put the, <laughs> put the <laughs> robot <laughs> costume on it, and people think he's a real. Yeah, we should make a big cardboard, uh, you know, cardboard and tinfoil costume. Beat the, beat the people from UC Davis. <laughs> <laughs> it's a men's team. Their goal is always to beat the fastest woman as a centipede. But put a bra on it. <laughs> so, so now that you know what you know, if I threw away all of your software, how long would it take you to reconstruct it? Uh, would you want to? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I might work on web startup or something easier. <laughs> um, well, is it the, the, the software, I mean, what is the important part? Of it? You know, the, the, walking, the walking algorithms are pretty simple. I mean, it's like all that balanced feedback stuff is a thousand or two lines of code, really. Um, and then there's a bunch of plumbing underneath it that's not well, that interesting. Before you did it? No. It, it took like dozens of different <coughs> attempts down different wrong paths that, that turned out to be dead ends. Did you, did you do a throw out and restart? You said you did it once. Oh, I mean, dozens. This is so that was a common. So we, 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 you know, we, most of the code is is sort of plumbing, and so that doesn't change very much. But definitely, that that high level walking algorithm has gone through dozens of of sort of completely different attempts. At so, so how, how how long does it take you to reconstruct the critical parameters? Um. Do you have to go walk a, a hundred hours of learning to, to reconstruct them? Probably not a hundred, but probably probably ten hours of walking to to get um, like a particular gate working smoothly, something like that. Um, are you adjusting those by hand, or are you, are you automating the process of, of try it and get back and see what happens? It's semi-automated. Um, you know, I. I like to do part of it by hand just to understand what's going on. Um, but also, like, the automated system will sometimes go down the wrong road, and I have to, 
I have to add something to the the you know the 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 goal function. Yeah, <laughs> a fudge factor. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we we tried we tried some sort of tabula rasa walking and simulation where where we could afford you know billions of steps. Uh, you know, running running parallel simulations on racks of workstations, um, and so it found all sorts of creative ways of of satisfying our goal function. Like the goal function is basically to move forward, you know, five feet and still be basically vertical, right? And so, you know, stand up. Did it ever do that? Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, oh, I mean, right, we had it, um, I mean, most of them are somehow exploiting um, bugs in the simulator, really. Um, <laughs> you know, s simulators, like any sort of, you know, oil or integrator has ways in which you can sort of abuse the damping term to get negative damping. Um, and so, you know, typically by sort of flipping, like if you can get the foot hitting the floor fast enough, you can often sort of get a big impulse up. Um, <laughs> And, you know, so even, even after sort of finding ways of penalizing those, you know, it would find ways of like falling over and, you know, doing a, a headstand and like there are millions of preposterous ways of, of making forward progress. And, and <laughs> That's what they do. They try every preposterous thing. Well, I don't think, I think they have some built-in idea of what's reasonable. Um, like they all sort of start by kind of pulling themselves up on something and just like starting standing, right? Um, but like if they just started to stand, they'd they'd fall over before they could learn anything. And so it's important that they have something to hang on to to at least sort of get them in a, a regime where they can where they can <coughs> practice that skill. Um, and humans walk remarkably alike. I mean, after watching a lot of videos of of simulated robots walking like there's a lot of weird ways of doing it um and 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 they're unacceptable uh you know for a bunch of reasons including sort of socially they look stupid um <laughs> you know like like the i mean we sort of saw goose stepping for example is one of the things that comes up and like that's socially unacceptable to have <laughs> goose stepping robots um uh, a lot of ways of getting it wrong Well, Asimo does stairs. Um, it's a very different physical body because it has uh, right. stiff joints and, and large feet. So, so it, has, it can have static stability most of the time. Um, I don't think anyone with flexible joints has done stairs successfully. Going up and down stairs without, ballistically, where you maintain some momentum is is, I don't think it's been done, has it? No, no. As most Right, yeah, so it right. stops and it's stabilizes, yeah. comes to a fixed position before it yeah. contemplates the next step. Yeah. So yeah, after so. You, after you take your 50 million steps, then you go back and, and <laughs> <laughs> Well, you just put a next step start sooner into the, into the goal, but then you fall over. Right, but that's always what you yes. get. That's the first step. Yeah, you're right. That's the first step. <laughs> put, put a time element into it, and suddenly the goal function will find it. So one of the things we built along the way was this harness that, that has some ropes to you know attach to the robot, and so they're normally slack. But when things start going wrong, you can quickly tension them up and hit, keep the robot from hitting the ground. Um, so we can do more or less automatic testing. You know, we usually like to have someone there in case the <laughs> rope gets wound around its neck or something. But um, does, so does that go into the sensor function to say, hey, we, you're using that much? Because you said kids are doing balancing, kids are getting feedback from their hands. And they eventually learn to get that down to zero. So I did build that at one point, actually. We had um, an external stabilizing. We had like four ropes with, with uh, torque generators attached to it so we could sort of hold it up even when the walking. It's a sensor function support. Um, well, we had, we had both. Um, and. Uh, but I think we got past that point. I mean, th that seemed interesting when I before I could get it to s to walk at all. But because my my plan was I'd I'd sort of you know have it take steps and you know hold it upright using the this stabilizing harness and you know tune it until the forces necessary to do that went down went to zero. Um, but after after we got there, it didn't seem that useful anymore. Um, 
but definitely like the cloud robotics lab is going to have a pretty serious plan for making sure the robots never hit the ground um, <laughs> you know and can be a lot of mistakes in that in that 50 million steps so you've got the in your budget Treadmills are weird. Um, I, I, yeah, I mean, I think you know what we really want is just a big enough floor space that we can get around, and the, and it's got to have some some uh, carpet and some concrete and some dirt and some sand and you know whatever else uh, we think we need to be able to walk on, um, and a bunch of complicated terrain and some stairs. And, you know, it's it's going to be a fairly big installation. Can I get your for more, please visit us at stanford.edu.